Hi, welcome everybody. Uh, I hope that uh, you all hear me okay. Everybody hearing me okay? Seeing me okay? Okay, wonderful. So, welcome to TWR Facebook Live. Um, so, this is our first uh, series of uh, the PIT instructions that I'm going to do. So, I wanted to welcome everybody. Very happy to be here. It was a little bit challenging. I am in northern part of uh, Italy, uh, a Rime uh, uh, Buddhist center. Tupnio uh, Sarling giving a talk tonight here. So I was up, really up in the mountain, and uh, so at the center the internet was uh, broken. So I have to find a little, go out of way and find a little bed and breakfast place in somebody's uh, basement here. So, but I'm here with all of you. So good to see you all. So uh, let me introduce you what this PIT instruction is about. Uh, so, we are calling it PIT instructions. It's about personal reflections on the heart essence of Dzogchen. Um, so, uh, for last 25 years, uh, I have been teaching in the West and uh, primarily uh, focusing on the teachings, the essence of the Dzogchen and also the way I have been teaching this Dzogchen teaching, it's a little bit more really like a more integrative way rather than separating these ancient wisdom traditions from our life. Uh, I'm trying to do as much as possible, integrate these essence of the teachings in our life. Uh, that means uh, uh, personally for me is also the same that uh, I try to uh, bring as much as possible the way I live, uh, bring the teaching in here, where I teach, bring the teaching there, where I work, bring the teaching there, where I interact, bring the teaching there. So some sense of it's a very much like an integral approach. The reason why I feel it's very important, the integral approach, is sometimes I feel uh, Dharma in the West uh, has certain issues sometimes people uh, come with a very pure heart, uh, pure devotion, a really sense of uh, wanting to learn and practice, but once they enter into the teaching and then the same old patterns comes up in their practices or learning of the practices, application of the practices, the way they live their life through the practices or where they're trying to serve others through the practices, then just their own um, the neurosis is just kind of manifest and, and somehow people manage to live um, a parallel life that one side, one is practicing a practitioner and go on and on and one side, this total neurosis, personality neurosis is able to live, so they are not kind of very connected to each other. So the approach here, this pit instruction is very much see how uh, we can really like uh, bring these things together and uh, more beneficial way. And also one reason why I feel it's very important is also because uh, at the end of the day, I think every religion, every spiritual path, every deep philosophy, every psychological method, uh, every uh, common sense of wisdom, wisdom should always help a social transformation. So if, if these deep tradition is not helping society or social changes, uh, and then I think uh, it's not, maybe there's something uh, problem, problem in there, if it doesn't change our collective sense of society, and it, I think it will be harder to change as a group, small group of people, if that is true, and it's probably hard to change one individual also. So if, if it really helps you, it, help, it should help you and your partner, it should help you and your sangha, and it should help you and your community, you and your 
country and so on. So it should somehow um, should manifest in the society uh, able to reflect and able to and and bring some social changes. So that is the idea: is that these pit instruction that should somehow affect the society as a services because end of the day we all truly trying to uh, help somewhere a mother is trying to uh, bringing up child properly or parents are trying to bring up child properly and uh, uh, a, a children trying to help aging and sick and dying parents or professionally, like people who are doing in social services and people are really trying to do their best to help others and then they issue up personal, uh, not able to handle conflicts, um, deadlines, um, burnout, and then stress, tension, depressions, and not able to handle and not able to do this service to others well. So these, so somehow I think in the end, we are all trying to help other people, but the the wisdom tradition should help us to help others more. So that is the purpose. So that if in that way we can help us, we can help also some sense of uh, social changes. So this is, and then the pit instruction. We will do this continuously today. I'm going to just do a little bit more introduction about what we are going to do. This is more like introduction. And then, and next week on, uh, we will uh, talk about maybe specific topics uh, on the path or, or what we call like. A, so I will explain that like a, some sense of um, in Tibetan tradition we say Ji Lam and Devu. Ji means the base, Lam means the path, Devu means the result. So some sense that. Uh, what it means to practice these three core uh, points, um, base, path, result. So what does that mean? So we will talk about that also. Um, so for just maybe just let's say, if, um, let's talk a little bit about these three things. Um, so there's a two different kind of ways to approach. One we can say base, je. Lam, path, devo, fruition or result. So basically, whole the essence of Dzogchen should uh, fit in these three main principles. And also, another way to look at it, it also we can say uh, Tawa, Gompa, and Chirpa. Um, Tawa means view, uh, Gompa means meditation or the path. Chupa means conduct or behavior. So somehow uh, they are also corresponds to each other, they are connected to each other. So, so basically the view, meditation and uh, behavior of Dzogchen, base, path, fruition of Dzogchen is the core principle or structure of how the knowledge has been presented by Dzogchen in the, the great uh, tradition of great perfection or Dzogchen. And uh, so what does that mean in terms of the practices? Uh, if I say a very simple way, uh, we say Tawa um, Tadal, a boundless view, boundless view, so it's easy to understand. Gompa um, Rangsal, a self arising meditation or self um, self arising meditation I think that's fine self arising meditation and then uh, fruition is chupa rupa like a, a flexible behavior or spontaneous behavior so some sense of that's really what core aspect of what it means uh, to have, have this sense of boundless view and have this sense of... Um, um, so, okay, let's say this way. Boundless view, self-clear meditation, spontaneous conduct. What does this mean? Okay, uh, 
Uh, I hope I'm trying to explain it as simple as possible. I hope I'm not getting into a complicated uh, discussion here. That's my goal is not to make things complicated, trying to make it as simple as possible. Um, so, so boundless views, the, the truth is boundless. Our individual essence is boundless. We are boundless being. The truth is boundless. Our essence is boundless. And the base, the foundation of everything is boundless. Um, so so this, that truth, that our essence, that base is what uh, we lose the connection to or that, that base is what we don't understand and that base is what we're trying to understand. And so whole some, some sense of philosophy, doctrine, discussions, basic uh, root text, commentaries, all are basically trying to explain that. So, so, but then it gets really like a complicated, really complicated and, and some, some uh, doctrines, some tenet system gets more complicated than the others. But whole idea is to trying to keep it as simple as possible because the truth is simple, it's not a complicated. We are complicated and we make things more complicated to understand that simple truth. Um, so the second is when we say a self arising meditation, what does that mean? That means some sense of that boundless view. If you don't manipulate, if you don't elaborate, if you don't change, if you don't run away from it, if you don't suppress it, if you don't, if you leave it as it is, and if you rest fully, you have a much more greater chance to, to recognize that boundless, boundless uh, base or the boundless view or the boundless truth or the boundless self. So you have much more greater chance if you leave it as it is. And uh, if you leave it as it is, so then you don't have to try to understand. Understanding arises by itself. So the self-arising awareness, the awareness is just there. For example, if I am uh, putting a lot of effort trying to be happy and I'm feeling sad because effort does not make you feel happy, I'm feeling sad and I'm doing this for years and years and years. Now to the point I'm not only sad but I'm really depressed, I'm really feeling a hopeless, I'm really feeling like a powerless, lost. And when you feel that kind of lack of energy, uh, 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 obscured with these uh, negative energy and blockages, then there's no way to awareness to arise by itself. Like when the cloud is completely obscuring the, this beautiful, boundless, clear sky, there's no way the sun to arise by itself, even if it's, it's arising by itself, but there's no way to have access to it because cloud is obscuring it. Same way that uh, for us, our true self, our boundless essence, our boundless truth, the base is obscured and awareness is difficult, awareness to arise by itself. So therefore we put a lot of effort. But when awareness does arise by itself, then, then the, the result is, is a spontaneous. So for example, when, 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 the, when, we are, when there's no clouds in the sky, the cloudless sky it appears spontaneously without any effort. When the clearless uh, sky is there, the, the effortless or the spontaneous light is there. When the spontaneous light is there, the, the warmth of uh, light is effortless. It's naturally there. So some sense, um, so some sense that um, there, these three aspects, they're kind of really like uh, connected to each other. And uh, one very important part of it is that uh, they all have some, in a Dzogchen teaching, they all have something to do with 
what call we what what we, what we call zimpa mepa uh, zimpa chalwa uh, so uh, we we talk about understanding of that base is non conceptual direct cognition so it's not like a uh, 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 it's not like a indirect uh, like a logic logic is log logic has not much place in the Dzogchen tradition. And in a way, it's, it's a, we say, through reasoning mind, through conceptual mind, through our uh, conceptual mind, we can never understand that truth. Therefore, uh, to you, if you are interested to understand that boundless truth, the only way to understand is to be free from the conceptual mind and rest in that non-conceptual awareness and non-conceptual awareness will effortlessly recognize the truth. So this is uh, what he's saying. So what I'm trying to say here is these three things, boundless view, self-arising meditation, a spontaneous uh, behavior, effortless spontaneous behavior, they all have one thing in common, it's non-grasping. Um, so the view is the view is never bounded, how you say that, sorry, the base is never bounded with grasping mind. And the meditation should never be polluted by grasping mind. The, the spontaneous effort should never be grasped and contracted by grasping mind. Whenever there is a grasping mind in the view, you don't understand the true, you don't have the self-realization. Uh, Whenever the grasping mind is in the uh, in the meditation, you will never have genuine experiences. Whenever the grasping mind is uh, grasp the the fruition or result or conduct or behavior, and behavior becomes very effortful, painful, uh, limited, uh, no spont uh, no spontaneity. So the grasping mind is somehow become obstacle in all these three different levels. So, so that is, I think, is one thing that's very, very important and common. Now, let's talk about, talk, talk about a little bit about this sense of um, uh, what I was saying earlier, that um, personality, our personality and our spiritual practice not living parallel, parallel to each other, but integration, they should be connected. So I think, I think that's really, really like important point that I'm trying to make here. Is the main point? Point is I'm trying to talk some philosophical, some uh, experiential basis to describe that. But the main point of what I'm trying to come is the place where there is a more integrative, uh, integrative aspect of our spiritual practices in our life. For example, I give some examples. Okay. Because we all have a life. You all have a life, right? Um, okay, let's be a little bit more interactive here. Do you all have a life? Of course you all have a life. How many of you are very, this moment in your life, how many of you are very engaged in your personal life? That means you're really uh, struggling or working or enjoying with your health, with, with, with yourself. How many of you are doing that? So uh, I hope you're all hearing me well and so I wanted to hear some uh, comments here. Personal life. So your sense of your you, you are very connected to your personal life. Maybe you are trying to really work hard to uh, eat well, or you're really trying to work hard to exercise more. You're really trying to work hard to uh, have less stress. You're whatever you're doing, but how much of you're doing on very much trying to uh, um, figure something out on a personal life? So this is the one question. If, if the personal life is important 
And if the practice is important, then they all need to, to be connected to each other. So this basically, that's, that's the number one. If your life, personal life is important, and if your, also if your spiritual practice is important, then the spiritual practice should help uh, well-being of personal life. They should not interfere each other. If your personal life is good, then that should help your spiritual development. They should not interfere with each other. Many times we live parallel life. They are not connected. Somebody might have a very nice uh, self-perception self of being a good practitioner, but personal life is very miserable. There is no awareness. You can, you can think about awareness, you can talk about awareness, you can read about awareness, and, and, but in life, there's awareness is very much personal life, awareness is very much lacking. How you eat, very much lacking. How you exercise, it's lacking. How you meditate, it's lacking. How you take care of yourself, it's lacking. So, uh, so basically you don't kind of have more like a good sense of personal life because your idea of spiritual practice is not connected to your personal life. Or, if somebody happened to have a good personal life, for example, good health, youthful, good gene, good, um, good country you're living in, good economic status, good family, but everything, but that all of those cause condition is not helping you to develop your spiritual practice because it's one day it's going to end. There is no true sense of spiritual development. It's not connected. So, so there is a clearly sense of very disconnected nature. Second one, for example, of course, uh, personal life is important for everybody, right? Everybody. So you just think about that. How much of your? Of course, I'm also when I'm talking to you, I'm also talking to myself. I'm not. Clearly, um, this is a Facebook life is very much for me is where I reflect a lot in myself um, and I also I'm trying to see what I feel, what I understand as a, as a reflection, self-reflection and I'm trying to see among them what will be more collectively useful for the, for the society and that's exactly those are the things I'm trying to share. I'm not trying to promote one tradition, one idea, uh, one specific theory. No, I'm trying to see everything that my life brought brought me a gift of my life with wonderful teachers that I have learned from blessings that I have to my from my teachers and uh, connection to this beautiful burned ancient traditions and access to the ancient traditions that I have learned. And I feel like how much this is not only um, just a very ancient exotic tradition, but how much it's timely message for modern society and the mo uh, socially beneficial. So those social beneficial part of those essential teaching and as a pith instruction, I'm trying to bring out by s reflecting together with all of you, reading all of your comment, that makes me reflect more or reflect differently. Next time I have something a little bit more different things to say. So it, you are my, you all of my uh, uh, a script, scripture, a text, uh, a Bible, or my uh, t text, my reference, my source, uh, where I'm learning from all of you, uh, l learning these teachings better and understand better and then bring it back to communicate with all of you better. So all of your comments and reflections, uh, what you shared with me on, in Facebook, it's very important the way of uh, where we all are growing together in this dialogue here. So I'm, I'm going back to the point. So personal life is very important for all of us. But the second part is the family life. 
maybe if if some of you are have left your life family life you have like some some of the yogis in tibet they just go up in the mountain rest of their life they have decided not to see anybody except their needs of food and water or something but they really like just cut completely off there are people who who feel the need of that there are people who benefited from that and that there are people who have achieved realization by doing that but clearly my life is not been like that and my life is my life is like this and this afternoon searching for internet connection and trying to see the face way i can do this facebook thing and um with my sangha all international sangha the cyber sangha my family my son who is in dharamsala uh, trying to struggle trying to take care all those things so i'm not living that hermited life for sure so i'm am living very much more yeah more very normal life nor normal life i would call it so so i do have family as a cyber sangha is my family people that who i would know only through the cyber but never met them might never ever meet them and some of them i have meet i i keep on meeting new people from the cyber sangha in person after many years but the regardless of i meet or not cyber sangha is some sense i feel family and i hope you all feel the family that this is what where we are trying to exchange and learn and really feel the sense of a uh, connection that we are feeling here it's equally a uh, strong enough that you you we are living in the same house this is this is this is really important point i have a fortune to grow up with my teacher age 10 until uh, i was 27 so and also able to maintain this beautiful deep relationship continuously going deeper and deeper deeper until now all 40 years of relationship and of course one time in one house but now in different continent but relationship never has never affected it's equally same so some sense i know in per this is the time limitless timeless a uh, uh, relationship a uh, connections uh, and since we don't have fully realization that we cannot have it at least internet helps to have that but sometime some point we will not internet we will not need wifi we will be always connected but right now internet is helping us to do that so sorry to talking a little bit too much here so coming back to the family so we 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 have a family and uh, but this relationship either it's a cyber either is a sangha either is a, a a non-profit organization in community either is in a company that sir having some kind of collective purpose together either is a spiritual community either is a family uh, a blood family uh, or friendship or between really two people one family we we are so much we live our life so much our experiences of feeling richness fullness or less full or lonely has so much to do with relationship and family relationship and sometime these family relationship are very distorted uh, in in families are very distorted and sometime in a spiritual spiritual uh, families relationship are very distorted and sometimes teacher and students relations are very distorted so it is really important for our, all of us to this this sacred relationship that we have any form that we have it has to also be integrated with the practices of this idea of boundless and spontaneous awareness how you say it? the effortless awareness a spontaneous behavior so this view meditation conduct uh, should this knowledge i this how you say the knowledge understanding and experience of this view meditation and conduct should help us live well in our relationship and transform the highest form in our relationship any form of relationship as a society if you look at the world today uh, politically speaking 
it very much represents dharma. Basically, if you think about boundless, means no boundary, or boundaries, it's divisions, boundaries. So, if you're trying to create more borders, if you're trying to create more walls, if you're trying to create more division between races, religions, sexes, and genders, and every boundaries that we create, it goes against this basic principle of boundless view. So, so in a way, um, if, if you're really truly this practicing this principle of boundless view, self-arising meditation, flexible conduct, um, a, a genuine warmth, they, there's no... Uh, closing is not an option. This is what I always tell myself. Uh, Any time I have personally, um, when I'm trying to be really open to, um, to anybody in my life, Clearly, sometimes those openness has been taking advantage, and uh, I, I know that. And uh, and obviously, of course, sometimes you f you feel hurt or you feel um, kind of a little bit close, and then you ref self reflect. You always meditate, self reflect, and uh, from that boundless openness, rest there, uh, trying to let uh, some spontaneous awareness arise and some spontaneous warmth arise, re-reflect, uh, restart like your computer, restart your body, speech and mind, and then you do feel like a little bit of shift and change, you feel like, a, of course, closing is not an option, not an option at all. But I can be a little bit more conscious, I can be a little bit more aware, I can take a little break, but continuously I need to open, and continuously I've, I need to see the openness is the solution. And uh, even certain problems what comes out of this openness, they are, they, you, you might think it's a problem, but end of the day, if you look from the right place, they are also some form of success, because they are also going toward, toward this boundless, um, um, boundless, um, openness direction. So, so some sense uh, you feel more um, strength, courage, um, confidence, uh, openness, warmth to continuously open by uh, giving yourself up, letting go your own ideas up, uh, uh, sharing your own successes, sharing your own wealth, sharing your own everything and obviously at the end of the day letting go of that famous grasping mind a little bit more. So that is truly a goal. So going back to this sense of family, so okay, how many people here that uh, reflecting a little bit more in the family? So this is my question to all of you. How, much, how many of you are very much engaged in working in your family? If, this, if the family is important, then that, that family relationship somehow should correspond together with view or meditation or conduct. Do you see any relationship there or not? If you don't see a clear relationship, then you know there is some kind of interruption or some some um, disturbances in in integration part. So this is I want everybody to reflect. It's not something that we have to come out immediately answer for everything, but basically your family life should affect positively your meditation. Your meditation should affect positively your family life. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll give a joke, uh, explain one story here. Stories are always helpful. One time I met a guy, he, he was talking about, uh, he said that he was uh, really seriously meditating and he came to one of my retreats and he said, uh, 
uh, we were talking about compassion and having compassion and particularly having compassion to your mother and the typical these Tibetan stories about your mother, most important, who has so you have to have compassion to all the sen sentient beings because all the sentient beings has been your mother at one point or another point. And then he said, well, if everybody has been made my mother, then I cannot have compassion. I have a big problem with my mother. My mother is a big obstacle for my spiritual practice. And uh, then she, he said, uh, but it was funny that he had a big fight f with his mother and she needed some help and he did not help. And uh, he left her and came to the retreat and here with me and where, where I'm saying, now you imagine your mother and have a compassion to her, who she, he just have a big fight with. So, so, so it's, it, that's exactly what, what I'm trying to say. So really like a, a compassion coming, following a teacher and learning, sitting on a cushion compassion, obviously you do that, but that should not interfere your compassion to your mother. So that compassion on the cushion should help real change the way you, you where you see your mother, where you feel about your mother, where you behave toward your mother, where you help your mother, uh, where you live with your mother. The compassion on a cushion should absolutely help that. And the way you behave with your mother, where you see your mother, should help compassion on the cushion too. But if one is not helping the other, or the other is not helping one, if there is no connection between them, then there is a seriously a problem there. And so that is what I think is really uh, important to address. And if, if there is a clearly connection, then whatever spiritual practice you are doing, ultimately it will help your um, social changes, social transformation, able to help other more that will affect that. Now the just as a, probably we are running, are running out of time, just wanted to conclude with this final part, professional. Now again, in the same story, some of you say, well, I don't have a professional, I'm, I, I'm a yogi, I'm, I live in a cave, so I, there's no profession. Or another one might say, I'm retired, uh, I don't need money, I, um, I'm just practicing, you know, my own, so no profession. But then there are a lot of people who are, who have profession, who are professionally successful and who are maybe entering into a career profession where you are also very, very seriously exploring your spiritual development. You are, or maybe you are in the middle age where you are deep in both, where you are in the middle, middle of your success of your profession and you are also in the middle of your development of your spiritual practices. Um, but maybe you feel, or oh, uh, I cannot really practice fully because um, because I have to work, and um, and uh, my work is interfering. There, I meet a lot of people who say that uh, they they're having a lot of problem with their work because they are practicing. And I also know there are a lot of people who are practicing, focusing so much on the practices, having a lot of a lot of problem at work. Uh, able to have a good relationship with work, able to see the work as a positive, able to see the work as an opportunity, able to deal with the conflicts of the work through their practices of boundless views, self-arising meditation, flexible behaviors are not manifesting in their workplace situation or they are not able to cope well with their deadlines or uh, conflict with their colleagues and um, Able, not able to relax where their deadlines, they lose their sense of playfulness, affecting by their health, and so on. So, so if you are in the profession, then you really have to see again, once again, how this boundless view, self-arising meditation, and, and spontaneous behavior, how does this view, meditation, and conduct is helpful in your profession, then profession is supporting your spiritual development or yes or no and or if not how it can be it has to be ultimately if not once again 
if there is no connection with your work and your practice, there is something fundamentally wrong. And, uh, and I think as, if you think about development, spiritual development, then you can think about it's, it's a driving on the highway. Maybe if you are integrated, your personal life and per family life and a spirit, professional life is integrated with your practicing, you are like in full speed of development. But if these are disconnected with each other, and if you feel you are doing practices but has nothing to do with three of these three areas of your life, even though these three areas of life is very important you, for you, is affecting your life all the time, but they are not connected you with your spiritual practice, that means you are driving a car with maybe, uh, I don't know, five kilometers an hour or ten kilometers an hour, very slow, very, very, very slow, and feeling like a, the, the, the powerless, the luck, or maybe running out of gases or something like that. So that is, I think, some sense of experiences. So, so I think, um, um, so that's really like a more or less, I think, what uh, I wanted to say today as a inter kind of general uh, view of this um, pit instruction and personal ref reflection of the essence of the Dzogchen teaching. And uh, maybe I'll just say one last thing is, big, one of the thing in a Dzogchen teaching, it says um, rest and effortless. And today's world, every, in everything, there's so much effort. In personal life, there's so much effort to be well. And in, in family life, there's so much effort and in professional life, there is so much effort, and effort is killing us. And effort is destroying the world. The effort is de making world not very har harmony place. And all this effort is coming out of pain and ego and fear. And core address these teaching is trying to address is is trying to address the the ego and fear and pain. And through these, we are trying to live life of personal life and family life and professional life. There you don't live good. So we have to find another way to live better, whole another way of looking at our life. So this is what we are trying to, I think uh, we, need to, we all need to learn. And uh, I hope that uh, in the uh, uh, next weeks to come, I hope we can discuss more how these integrate these two aspects of our life and our spiritual practices. So these pit instructions will go on um, today is September 6th and it will continuously go on until November 26th. And uh, so idea is uh, every week, I think it's uh, every Wednesday, so I know uh, my a host there, Mariela is, uh, I see Mariela is there. Thank you, Mariela. And uh, doing wonderful work there, host, uh, posting all the things what our Sangha, Cyber Sangha needed to know. So, uh, but I wanted to be everybody, I want everybody to, to be very flexible, so not get stuck with the idea of every Wednesday and every exactly time, even though I'm trying to do it, do my best. So sometime today was, it was very hard to try to find this place uh, to in one bed and breakfast place in the mountains in Italy. I don't even know these people here. This the people the center they ask this bed and breakfast place. Let me uh, do this in in their basement here. They they are making this essential oils and you see some bottles here. So. Uh, but sometimes there's a place uh, it's difficult to do, so that means I might have to change the date or cancel the whole uh, thing. So please be flexible, but I will try to be, do my best to be. And also, uh, many of you, this is a very important announcement, and many of you know uh, that His Holiness Lung Dot Tembi Nyemaru Muche, Mary whose health is uh, not very well, and uh, I know many, oh, most of everybody knows, so it's all already been in Facebook and the internet. So, um, so, but all the uh, 
uh, our uh, teachers and our Sangha members in the Mary monasteries, the monks and lamas, they all are there taking care of as well as possible His Holiness. So, uh, Rob, also uh, our president of Ligmaji International, has sent out a message uh, on the page. So, basically, uh, please keep in prayer, uh, invocation of uh, long life mantra, Ishiwamu invocation, and mantra of Sharab Chama, those you know and those you don't know and wanting to do. And you will see in my Facebook page, uh, they are posting uh, the image of His Holiness and the mantra there. So uh, we have been doing last uh, a few years, uh, always kind of accumulating things for our teachers. And particularly last two years, we've been more focused on accumulating for His Holiness. And now we're specifically requesting all of you. And I, and also our Colorado Sangha, I, am, I apologize to cancel the retreat there. And so I, next week, I am uh, going to India to visit His Holiness. And I will also let him know that all international Arasaibal Sangha is practicing for him. So please uh, keep in prayer and uh, thank you so much everybody so i will uh, i will see you all next week thank you